let's take a look at the the individual lesion and we'll start with interferon since that was our 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 first agent. So Sven, tell us a little bit about use of interferon both historically and where it plays a role now. Yeah, I mean it was heavily used uh, 20 years ago when it was uh, coming to the market and um, the majority of patients in Germany um, were treated with the different interferon beta preparations over years. However, since the approval of the oral agents, uh, DMF and teriflonamide, um, we don't find too many patients starting with interferons anymore. So it's, uh, there is a significantly a decrease in the usage of interferons. However, um, especially patients being stable over years on interferons, they like to continue therapy with these injectables. And so never change a winning team. Interferon patients who are stable on treatment continue this treatment. However, for uh, newly diagnosed patients, they are looking, at least in, in our country, more for the oral agents. And uh, so there is a development in this uh, injectable market, I have to say. Any thoughts on the mechanism of action? Yeah, th this is <laughs> a quite good question. And I think we can spend uh, the next 30 minutes uh, talking about the mechanism of action. So for our patients, we, we try to keep it simple. And we are talking about a shift from Th1 responses towards Th2 responses. but. I think we, we all know that, that there are many effects contributing to the mechanism of action of interferons. I think if we have um, the pathophysiology of MS in mind, we can nearly say that each and every step in this whole cascade is somehow impacted uh, by interference. So it alters the, the cellular recognition via modulation of MHC2 and the T cell receptor, it reduces thereby lymphocyte activation and proliferation, but it has also an impact on the transmigration over the blood brain barrier from the periphery to the central nervous system. And, and some people, uh, or there is some data um, published that also in the CNS, this leads to a downregulation of uh, pro inflammatory cytokines and uh, it shifts somehow the differentiation also in the CNS towards the TH2 answer. So, uh, very broad mechanism of action. Yeah, not entirely clear which one is the, the primary player, if there is a primary mechanism yeah. involved. Wallace, use of interferon, you can? Yeah, so I think that um, I'm sure like in other countries, our use of interferon as a, a first line or uh, a first DMT for people with MS is um, definitely on, on uh, the downward slope. I guess a couple of new things or a couple of one new thing in the last year would be the change in the label for pregnancy in, in, in Europe. So we now have the option of treating women um, who are wanting to fall pregnant or, or during pregnancy and breastfeeding. And that's on the basis of um, observational studies um, suggesting this approach is safe. And I think there's also still a role for interferons and uh, other uh, injectable therapies in, in patients with certain comorbidities that, that make other treatments difficult. So I recently saw a patient who'd had a renal transplant, and so they were immunosuppressed on uh, uh, two immunosuppressant medications and low-dose steroids, and they developed relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis on top of, on top of that. So uh, one of the injectable agents, the patient in this case went for interferon, uh, is, is a good option because you don't need to worry about uh, drug interactions or uh, immunosuppressive effects. Tricia? Well, I think, uh, with regard to interferon beta, I think the use is, is absolutely dropping in the United States, but I agree with Sven. Patients that are on it, that are doing very well, that are very happy with it, not having any significant side effects, there would certainly be no reason to change them. Yeah, we've had the same experience. Um, haven't started many patients with interferon, but I have a whole cadre of individuals that I've been treating since November of 1993, uh, when, when we first got interferon beta 1B, um, and, and they've done just spectacularly well. I mean, as we know with 
all of these agents, there are some people who have responded to all of them. And, and, and I think the, the don't change a winning team was much the logic. So they may say, well, I'm not that happy about these injections, um, but I don't want to change because I've done so well uh, over the years. Um, and I must say, going back to 1993, just say it was one of the most exciting periods of my professional life when we had our first therapy come along uh, for a disease. So it was really a very exciting time. Um, uh, the other issue with interferon right here and now is it's when I've gotten phone calls from patients, as we all have, saying, what about this COVID-19? The ones that have called me on interferon, I say, you're in a great position because not only doesn't it immunosuppress you, but interferon is part of the innate immune response that helps you to fight off viral infections. So we're happy to have you on, on interferon. And so I think they'll continue to be a use for it in individuals. Um, and, and, and we'll come back to, to the comorbidity issue after we have a discussion about uh, glutaramiracetate. 